stretch, you can cough as loud as you like now. You're not going to disturb anybody. Scratch, sneeze, move your legs, move your bum. <coughs> Get yourselves comfortable for the next part of this evening's festivities. <laughs> A dumb talk. Excellent. So, for this evening's Dhamma talk, I had all sorts of ideas what I was going to speak about, actually not many of them, but it's quite obvious what I should speak about tonight because uh, it's a problem which is common to so many people and I've just been feeling it and just overcoming it through this meditation, tiredness. Uh, about ooh, three, four, five years ago, I cannot remember when. It's a trouble with living in the present moment. As a monk, we don't get dementia, we just get living in the present moment-ness. <laughs> so we don't really think too much about past and future. So people say, when did that happen? I lived in the past somewhere, but you don't exactly remember when. And it's not as if you don't want to remember, it's just the efficiency of the brain and living in this moment, rather than always living in that past. But a few years ago, uh, when I was teaching overseas, as I often do, I was uh, invited to spend the day at a youth seminar in Kuala Lumpur. It was a very interesting occasion, about four or five hundred young people from fifteen to twenty-five doing all sorts of interesting stuff. One of the things they were doing is that they asked all the people there, what is your most difficult emotion? As a 15 to 25 year old, mostly Chinese Buddhists over in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. What do you find most difficult of all in life? And the answer which came up was tiredness. And I never expected that before, but once I, they said that, it was quite obvious why people are tired, even when they're in their late teen years, 15 to 25. You can remember, in you know, your time as a young man, a young woman, the pressure is really on you. You have to do well at school, because your parents and teachers and friends say it's really important, so you have to do really well at homework and get good grades. There's one of the problems with young people that it does, uh, parents tell me off for this, but I'm supporting the young people. It doesn't matter so much what grade you get at school. And people have found Daniel Goldman, emotional intelligence, found out that the grades you get at school and university, all those certificates, they don't really count for much when it comes to success in life. Success is not guaranteed by doing well at school. Something else is. That's why I was telling people just yesterday in Singapore, I came through there on the way back from Thailand, or well, this morning, no, it was last night. Last night in Singapore, that. So if ever your kids get an F at school, do they ever work out what F means? Because I was a school teacher. F means fantastic. <laughs> if they get an E, that means excellent. But if they get an A, it means arrogant. <laughs> For all these people who get so proud of getting A's and straight A's, I mean they really are a pain in the butt, aren't they? So just they're so full of themselves, I've got straight A's, I'm a <laughs> So I prefer the F's, the fantastics, <laughs> the excellence. Because it's not so much just you know, the, the pressure on succeeding in that uh, competition to get good grades or to get a place in a good university. Look at me, I've got a place in one of the best universities and all what happened to me? Didn't do me any good going to Cambridge. I might as well have just gone to any old, any old college, even no college at all. Still, actually if I hadn't gone to Cambridge I'd probably come a monk even earlier. That'd been good, but anyway. 
So this is just what happens in life. You learn something there. On that subject, I like rambling because uh, one of the the important events in my life as a student, which turned me more towards being a monk rather than being an academic. At the time, I didn't realize its importance. But when you look back and you find, well, these are real crucial experiences which actually direct you in life. And that was when uh, I, was, I was a Buddhist at university, I had a few other Buddhists, but one of my best friends was a Christian, a very strong practicing Christian. And he became a hippie later on in life. But anyway, he's a really strong Christian. And so he told me one day that together with his couple of his friends in Bible study class, they'd started to volunteer once a week to go to the local hospital for those who had mental disabilities and volunteer. And when he told me that, I didn't want to go. But I felt if I didn't go, I was letting down the team, Buddhism. So the only reason I volunteered to go was just ego, just pride. Just if the Christians can do it, the Buddhists can do it as well. That's all it was. And I'll be quite honest, I just went there because he was going there, so I had to go there. But a strange thing happened. Like many things in life, you go and do something for one reason, you find out other reasons start to become predominant and it really changes your life because those Christians, they went for two or three weeks and then they dropped out. I went there for two years, every afternoon when I was you know, up in Cambridge. And I would rearrange you know, tutorials and everything so I could go there. I loved it. And I wondered why. Why did I enjoy going there? Because I was, I was uh, helping out in the occupational therapy unit for those people with Down syndrome. And incredible to see emotional intelligence those kids had. Well, not, not kids, young men, young women. Even though I never knew the word emotional intelligence, this was in was 69, 70, 71 or something, still they were just so sensitive to a world which I hadn't really been trained in. And I always remember a couple of occasions, you know, as a young man, you know, you split up with your girlfriend, and so you go there, and they'd pick it up straight away. I wouldn't need to tell them. They'd come running out and give me a hug. So what are we doing that? I said, there's something wrong, isn't there? How the heck do you know that? And they were just so sensitive to my feelings. They got to know me and love me, and they had this incredible emotional sensitivity. And when I was sitting next to Nobel laureates, which I did in a place like that, they were socially so insensitive. They hadn't got an emotional neuron in their brains. Well, they did, but well, I'm exaggerating there. But when it came to the professors of life, I preferred to spend the afternoon with people with Down syndrome. I learnt much more from them, and I grew much more from them. How to empathise with people. When you're with the professors or the lecturers or even your friends, they were all talking, uh, you know, the word is go my yang. Bull no, it takes a while to say that's a party word for bullshit. You know your friends were talking all in their head, and they had no idea of their feelings. You know, the boys and the girls, they couldn't understand how to get on with each other and just just all f fantasies and dreams and ideas and philosophies. But you go with these uh, people with Down syndrome and they felt and they knew the emotions. They couldn't really do well at school. They were terrible at uh, things like maths. But when it came to being able to feel what you were feeling and actually be kind to you, they were geniuses. And it came to the point, I'd rather spend the afternoon with those people than with professors. I didn't know why at the time, because it was actually encouraged me in another area of life, this great emotional intelligence. And it's because we're not sensitive to that inner world of emotions, we keep thinking too much, doing too much, it's one of the reasons why we are tired. But anyway, these young kids, I saw, that was their biggest problem in life. And once they told me that, and they told everybody, just it opened up such huge areas 
of improving our lives, both physically and emotionally, and with relations as well. How many of you, when you come home from work, are grumpy, even angry? So many people keep asking me, my husband is just such a bad mood every time, he's always shouting at the kids, he's a terrible pain in the neck to live with, why? Can you get him some anger management counselling or something? And I basically say, well, teach him how to sleep at night. Teach him how to take, have a good rest. See if you can overcome that tiredness, which is so deeply embedded in our humanity today. And I, I'm only saying this because this is how I understand things. There's no research to back me up here. But I'm sure that if people did that research, they'd probably discover what I know. And that is that it's tiredness which creates so many divorces. So many relationships which break up because of tiredness. And sicknesses such as cancers, heart disease because of tiredness. And even other things, the obvious sickness which is very prevalent today is depression. A very deep tiredness. And it's such an obvious thing that there is a big problem in this world. Maybe you've had times of tiredness. It's as if the world is just too heavy to bear any longer. You really have to push so hard just to get by. The struggle takes so much energy and at times you've got no more energy to give. You go into this hole of depression, just absolutely low energy. Nothing actually to give to anything. Can't even get out of bed sometimes. You don't even want to get out of bed. You don't want to eat or do anything. Simply because you've just got absolutely no energy at all. You are deeply tired. We have now chronic fatigue syndrome. I don't remember that when I was a kid. Chronic fatigue syndrome. Why is that? Now of course obviously that that is a problem, tiredness. And the reason is because we have so much to do in this world. The reason I'm rushing off after this talk is because you know, there was a monk, you know, Bhante Gunaratana, he's a very famous monk, really nice monk. He's been here before, he's 88, and he was supposed to come and teach a meditation retreat at Jana Grove this weekend. When we heard he was here, we moved heaven and earth to try and get him to come here to get the retreat free for that weekend and advertise it, buy him the airline tickets, but then he got too sick. So his doctor said, no, you can't come. So, the where does a buck stop? At the top. So I've got to teach the retreat in this place. So that's why, and I should be relaxing this weekend. I've just been a long trip to Thailand, teaching so many hours. And on Monday morning, I'm off again to Korea to teach there. This will be a rest for me. So I am tired. And I could be exhausted. But there's another thing which I know which what happens when you've been a meditator monk for so many years, how to deal with that tiredness so it doesn't cause you depression, irritation, anger or these other emotional and physical sicknesses. How we deal with tiredness in this world. Because we have to do much more than maybe our ancestors did. So how do we deal with that tiredness? One, if you are tired, you can't afford Forward to worry about the future. You haven't got any spare energy to waste. So sometimes when I'm very busy, I refuse to look at my calendar. If I looked at my calendar, <laughs> no one could ever do that. Some of the other monks look at it. How do you do that, Ajahn Brahm? Because I don't look at it. You do live in the present moment. Because how much energy do you waste worrying? that you will not be able to cope. I never do that, because I notice how that is going to be awful. I, t <laughs> I told one of the monks today, because I was just really exhausted, I remember a time when I was a young monk in Thailand, wandering around from monastery to monastery, having a great sense of freedom, but on this occasion I've been travelling all day, from just after lunch, our lunch is about nine o'clock and that's it for the day. And they're travelling all day in hot weather. I was in a, 
a, a Thai bus, not like the Thai buses these days. The Thai buses these days are fantastic. People say, what are you talking about? I've been there, it's not fantastic. This was 40 years ago and there's really hot and just cramped, you know, small seat for two and there's usually three in there plus a chicken and pig or something else. I don't know what else was in there. Cramped up for hours after hours after hours. And finally got to this monastery where I was supposed to be going to. Uh, I remember the time, quarter to six, 5.45 in the evening. And checked in, there was two monks there. They said, oh, welcome, yeah, you can stay here, but you've got 15 minutes to take a quick bath because at six o'clock we all have to meditate for four hours. No moving. What? I've been on the road all day, I'm tired. I'm not going to be able to handle that. But the wisdom of my practice kicked in. I think I said this a couple of weeks ago. The old story of moving the wheelbarrows of earth. If you haven't heard that story, it's in Opening the Door of Your Heart, one of the first books which I wrote. And it's a story of, as a young monk, I have to move earth from nine o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the evening, three days because my teacher wanted it to be moved. That was really hard work, no really heavy labour, but oh, you don't mind. I was fit and healthy. I'm fit and healthy now. And it finished. That night Ajahn Chah went to another monastery. And the second monk, who's the head monk now, second monk said, you put it in the wrong place, move it. Another three days of hard work. I can handle that. But you get very dirty and just sweaty and mosquitoes. You've got both, handle, both hands on the handles of the wheelbarrow. You can't sort of keep the mosquitoes off you. You're sweating and oh, the mosquitoes, they really have a great lunch when you're working like that. So after six days, whew, finished at last. And that night, my master Ajahn Chah came back. The following morning, he said, why have you moved the earth over there? I thought I told you to move it in that other spot. Move it! Another three days of hard physical labour in the mosquito-ridden sweaty jungles. Now those people who work for the Japanese in the Second World War, I know what they feel like, honestly. Really hard work. Actually they were, actually we were malnourished as well. You should see photos of me in those days. Nothing like, you wouldn't recognise me, honestly, from what I look like today. I just, uh, being a bit fat today is just balancing what I did when I was young. It's like fair. <laughs> but anyway, really hard work. When it came to the next day, six days already passed and three more days of hard work were in front of me, I started complaining. I was exhausted, tired, had enough. I complained. I always say it was great in those days because there's hardly any other Westerners there just working with the Thai monks and the Laotian monks. So, you know, you could swear in English. I thought, no one would understand you. But even though they never understood any English, just they could pick up your body language, you were really suffering. And that was when one of the monks, I forget who it was, but whoever you are, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you taught me. Because he said to me, Pushing the wheelbarrow is easy. Thinking about it is the hard part. <laughs> he got me, he nailed me. I was thinking about it, that was the hard part of pushing a wheelbarrow for another three days. Doing it is easy. And so, thank you, thank you, thank you. I stopped thinking about it and it became fun again. You know, you had races with the other monks who get there first. You know, you're shoveling, and your turn to go on the shovel, putting earth you know, into the wheelbarrow and oh sorry, I, 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 I did throw it a bit hard, sorry. On purpose of course. <laughs> just having fun and games, messing around, it's so much good. But anyway, just <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm really pretty playful. That We had a, uh, I went to a conference in Vietnam a couple of years ago and if you go to conferences, you know, big organised conferences, now the organisers want you to see some of the sites. I don't like being a tourist, but you had no choice. So they took the, us in the, the middle of Vietnam somewhere uh, to these, 
there's lakes and underground tunnels and stuff, you know, where you go through in a barge. It's really fascinating, beautiful place. But anyway, on the way back, uh, we, were, we had a few... Um, actually, I was, re I was weird, I was representing Singapore, not Australia. So I was in the Singapore boat, and there was another Singapore boat. We had the Theravada monks in our boat, and the Mahayana boat monks in the other boat. So I looked at them and said, right, a race. Who's better, the Mahayana or the Theravada? So those are the two parts of Buddhism. So we had a race between Mahayana and Theravada. I was in a Theravada boat, paddling for all I could. And the Mahayana monks, they were paddling really hard as well to see who would win. And of course, it's obvious the Theravada would win. It's obvious if you know anything about Buddhism, because the Mahayana, they're bodhisattvas. They even let other people get to enlightenment before they do. So they made us get to the finishing line before they do. That's their tradition. <laughs> they're just playing around. Monks have a lot of fun. We do really stupid things sometimes, but it's good fun. You know, sometimes religion can be far too serious. And I just re rebel against serious religion. But anyway, that this was uh, where I learned how to have fun because I was exhausted, moving all those wheelbarrows, but instead of thinking about it, I just did it. And all the tiredness vanished. Just like this evening. All the tiredness vanishes when you stop thinking about it. Thinking about the future, worrying about it. Because most of your energy gets wasted in thinking. If you are tired, if you had a very busy day, for goodness sake, you can't afford to think and complain and worry and get afraid and plan this and plan that. Your brain's exhausted, give it a break. But what do people do when they're tired? They get grumpy, they don't know how to just to be. They always sort of tend to think too much. And that is the most important reason why people are tired. Thinking way too much rather than just doing it. So I don't know what you're going to do this weekend. So don't just think about it, just do it. Tell that to your husband, he's got to clean out the garage. So oh, I'm busy. So don't think about it, husband, just do it. <laughs> you've got to go and have a biopsy. Don't just think about it, because that really, quite, you get really exhausted thinking about, oh, is it cancer, I'm going to die. Don't just think about it, just do it. Even dying itself. Dying is okay, just don't think about it, just do it. <laughs> if the thinking about it is a problem, but don't actually do it on purpose, just, you know, just when it happens. So that's one of the reasons why I learned that much of tiredness is a physical exhaustion, which you can't do too much about. Actually, you can do something about it, but the major point of tiredness is a mental, emotional tiredness. And emotional tiredness is just because that you are trying way too hard. I don't know why you're trying. Sometimes people are trying because, oh, I have to. No, you don't. But, but, but my boss expects me to do some work. As long as he thinks you're doing some work, that's good enough for the boss. <laughs> How many of you read, I love reading cartoons, the Dilbert cartoon. And remember that Wally. You know, in the Dilbert cartoons, Wally is this guy, he's in the office, you only ever see him carrying a cup of coffee. You know, from the left to the right, the right to the left, he never does any work. He just carries the coffee backwards and forwards and appears like he's doing some work. That's why he keeps his job. Maybe that's why I keep my job. <laughs> Appearance. <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway, so this is a very lovely other cartoon which I saw the other day, rambling again. Somebody sh sent it to me, and it's a wonderful one to, to talk about, you know, why people worry about death. And you know, just, don't worry, it hasn't happened yet. Don't think about it. Don't worry about the future. And this cartoon was of Peanuts, you know, Snoopy and Charlie Brown, those wonderful characters. And honestly, read those comics because you get far more sense out of those comics than you ever do out of editorials or other news articles. And they're far more insightful. And this Peanuts, sorry, this Charlie Brown and his dog Snoopy, well, must be on vacation somewhere, so they're on a pier. 
and they were sitting there enjoying the afternoon, this beautiful view, just you know, mountains and lakes and waters, having a beautiful afternoon there. And Charlie Brown says to his dog Snoopy, he says, you know Snoopy, all of us one day will die. And Snoopy, this great philosopher, he really is a wise dog, much wiser than human beings. Snoopy says, true, one day all of us will die, but most days all of us won't die. <laughs> what a wise thing to say. Yeah, one day you'll die, but most days all of us won't. <laughs> so why are you getting so negative? <laughs> so don't think about it. Because thinking about those things, that more than anything else is what ties us. So you get your kids trying to get your good scores and tea. You don't think about it. It doesn't matter that much. If you can do well in that, fine. You know, if it's natural, you're naturally gifted, fine. Don't push yourself too hard, for goodness sake. Some parents get really upset at me for that, but I want those kids to have emotional intelligence, to feel loved and respected, even if they don't do well in those examinations. As I keep saying, half of your children, all the people here today, half of your children will be below average intelligence. Come on, it's logical. It's, it has to be that way. Half of your children will be below average intelligence. It has to be. That's what average means. If you're all Einsteins, half of the Einsteins have to be below average. <laughs> but what do you think? No, not, not my kids. No, not my kids. Their kids are okay, but not mine. My kids. So look, give your kids a break. Let them be, because if you take the pressure off your kids at the early age, they won't get so tired, and they will develop the emotional intelligence which I saw on those Down syndrome people. Beautiful people. They couldn't do sums. They couldn't be an electrician. They could be a monk. They felt. They were sensitive. And they had these beautiful relationships with each other. Brothers and sisters, institutionalized, but really, really kind. I saw that. Now, what type of person do you want to be? Your kids be? And they weren't tired. They had fun. And when we accept ourselves for what we are, instead of like, you know, going back to your kids, don't push them. Let them just develop, nurture them, encourage them, inspire them. But who knows what they're going to be in this life? They're not all going to go to university, and it's terrible that everyone has to go to university. There's so much more to the world and life. And so many people in this world, they just, university kills them. There was a, a graffiti, which I remember, outside the philosophy department. Uh, no, it's actually this was outside the physics lab in Cambridge. Graffiti in those days, you'd actually go looking for it because it was really profound. And that was exams kill by degrees. It's a wonderful pun on word. They kill by degrees. They kill learning. They kill you know, um, the excitement of investigating knowledge. When you have to be tested and graded and who gets the best. It actually kills emotional intelligence at academic institutions, mostly. Maybe they change somewhere, but most of them, they kill that ability to explore and also to, uh, to cooperate with each other because your skills are all personal. You have to compete against your best friends. And of course, that causes a lot of tiredness. A lot of, you have to live up to something you can't be. Now that is a stress of life. Me? Oh, I don't sort of uh, have any stress giving public talks. Years and years and years ago, I worked it out. So simple. That if I give a public talk and you guys like it, wonderful. I get so much joy seeing you happy and see I can actually help you and, and change your life. So I'm really happy, you know, if my talks are really well received. 
but I'm even more happy if you don't like them because then you can leave me alone and I can spend more time in my cave and just enjoy my life, retire, because you don't like my talks. You've heard all the old jokes before, all the stories before, so none of you actually come here. Brilliant! That actually is my, my trick, is my strategy. It did not work. I decided to write all my stories in books so you don't have to come back anymore and to keep telling them until you get so bored that you won't come back. But it doesn't work. You keep coming back for more. You must be all masochists. <laughs> but no. The point was, I don't care. Either way, life is good. You succeed, you don't succeed. But the trouble is, the pressure is on you in this world. You have only one idea of success. And, or limited ideas of what being a successful person is. Now I want to try and sort of make more. Um, ideas of success broaden it. So you can just, you know, even if you're living out on the street, you're living out on the street happily. Is that success? Sometimes people think, oh, that poor person. You ask the person, say, no, I'm free. I don't have to worry about, oh, well, it's a bit cold, maybe. Have you ever lived out on the street? I remember just in the hippie years, camping out under bridges. I remember as a monk, you know, one of the most wonderful times I had as a monk was when we had to leave the monastery in Thailand. After five years, you had your basic training. Out, 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 go. And we had just to walk. And everything I owned, I carried with me. And it wasn't that much. You could walk, it was light. All my possessions were on my back and it never ate. And there was a beautiful feeling of freedom, like being a bird. And you could be a bird as a human being. At every crossroad I came to, you could go any direction you wanted. You had no pressure on you to get anywhere to achieve anything. You had no deadlines, no appointments. You just, oh that looks a nice direction, I'll go down there. And you had this wonderful ability, you could sleep anywhere in a rice field, in a, in a paddock. The best place, my teacher said, to, to sleep as a monk in that time was in the, in the cremation grounds. And the reason was is because the Thai people were so scared of ghosts, you'd be guaranteed having a peaceful evening <laughs> if you went there. But if you go anywhere else, they'd always come asking you for questions or whatever. So the cremation grounds were the favourite place to go and sleep at night. And it's, it's a good place, everyone else was sleeping there as well. Or the corpses. Or the corpses. <laughs> it was a very nice place to have a But anyway, it was a beautiful feeling of, you had no pressure on you. So much freedom, wherever you wanted to go. And in the morning you could go to any village and get enough to eat on the arms round. So you didn't have to worry about it. You didn't need any money, you didn't have any money. Just had your, your arms bowl. And it's a beautiful feeling of freedom. And even though you walked a long distance and it was hot, you never felt tired emotionally because you hardly thought, because there was nothing to think about. What do you think about? Your worries. Where you have to be? How are you going to get there? We waste so much time an energy worrying about the future, which is why if you want to overcome tiredness, and it's a big problem for you, one of the things is please learn how to keep your mind efficient. Doing life is easy, thinking about it is a hard part. Living with a partner is easy. If you think about it, it drives you crazy. And I, I, honestly, I just in Thailand they were saying, oh my husband keeps yapping at me and he's really nasty to me. And I said again that if your husband comes home and he's always nasty to you, says all these bad things, remember why you were born with two ears. One to go in, one to go out. Don't keep anything. Because when you keep it, that's called thinking about it. You let it go immediately. 
And that's that ability to let go of stuff which is not necessary. That's the secret for overcoming tiredness. Let go of thinking, just do it. Let go of the future. You're exhausted worrying about what's going to happen next. And let go of the past. And when it goes to let go of the future, I don't know if I told this a couple of weeks ago, but a very wonderful compliment which I got uh, two or three, four weeks ago, I did my annual visit to the Cancer Wellness Association. They started off in this, this old house in Cottesloe, and the government, good on the West Australian government, they actually put a lot of money into building a huge campus, everything to do with cancer. So there you will find the Melanoma Society, the Prostate Cancer Society, the Breast Cancer Society, and the General Wellness Association, just all in one area, which is brilliant. And I go there every year. And when I went there, I was reminded of my 26th year going there. It's a long time, 26 years. And they said, the reason we always invite you back, usually the first talk of the season, the first talk of the year, to get it started in a good way, was they said there was, 26 years ago, there was a girl there, a woman, she had cancer, she got into remission, but she always worried what would happen if it came back? What would happen if it came back? And no counsellor could help her. And then this monk comes along and tells the story of the other great philosopher. I told her already about Snoopy, the American philosopher, the greatest philosopher of the last century. But there was even an earlier English philosopher I really, really respect. If you like philosophy, check out one of the best philosophers who's ever been written about, called Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> now, the other philosophers who teach in university, they're just full of just too many words. They never get to the heart of it. And this Winnie the Pooh, one of my favorite stories, it would have been in Opening the Door of Your Heart, but I actually rewrote to Disney, who actually has the copyright for Winnie the Pooh now, and they said absolutely no, because Disney is just so commercial, they won't allow anybody, even a tiny, tiny little bit from that book of Winnie the Pooh. And anyway, the story was, which I told 26 years ago, the Cancer Wellness Association, the story was about Winnie the Pooh and Little Piglet walking through the forest when there was a storm. And Twigs were coming down, branches were coming down, and then trees started getting uprooted. Storms are dangerous. You shouldn't be out in a storm in a forest. And so Piglet was really afraid, and his fear got so huge, he turned to Winnie the Pooh and said, I can't go any longer. I can't walk on any longer. I'm so afraid. Why? said Winnie the Pooh. I'm so afraid that a tree might fall when we are underneath it. Which was a possibility. And Winnie the Pooh, he shot back, which showed what a great philosopher he was. If he didn't have so much hair, he could have been a Buddhist monk. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he shot back with what would happen if a tree fell when we were not underneath it. And that was the end of the fear. <laughs> because all fear is looking to the future with a negative mind. Thinking of all the things which will go wrong with a fault-finding mind. That's what's called fear. The other opposite is hope. Looking at the future with a positive mind. What might go right? And you will have noticed in your life, if you fear something, it's more likely to happen. With hope, what you hope for is more likely to happen. So when I told that story to this girl 26 years ago, I answered a question. What would happen if the cancer came back? The answer was, what would happen if it didn't come back? And it never came back. And that's why they keep inviting me there. I come back but the cancer doesn't. <laughs> now you can understand, let's analyze that a little bit deeper, it's obvious. 
when you look at it a bit deeper. If you're worried about the cancer, what will happen if we come back, if we come back? You're getting tense. You're getting worried. The sort of things, the sort of stress which causes cancer, you are just putting into place. But if you think, well, what happens if it doesn't? You don't worry about it. Which means you're more relaxed, more healthy, and the chances are the cancer is not going to come back. You increase the chances of success, good health, happiness. And also you don't get so tired, worrying about what will happen. Deeper. This is meditation teachings, but it's brilliant teachings, two parts of the human mind. This is why people get tired. I call it the doing and the knowing. If you've been to any of my meditation teachings, you'll know this, but it's a very powerful way of looking at the human mind. The doing mind is what reacts. It's reacting to what I'm saying, thinking about it, saying, oh, that's good or that's rubbish. That reaction is called doing. Planning, remembering, figuring out things, initiating action, deciding to walk, figuring out what you're going to do when you leave here and where you're gonna, uh, what you're going to do on the weekend. All that is part of the doing mind. The other part of the mind is just what knows. The passive consciousness, just being aware, feeling the itch on your arm, feeling the coolness of this room, hearing the sound of the traffic in the distance, just knowing. Now, once you know the difference between those two parts of the human mind, it won't take you long to notice that most of your mental energy, 90, over 90% 90 of it, goes into doing stuff, reacting. Which means you've hardly got anything left just to know, to be aware to feel. Which is why that so many people, they can't even see the stars at night, even when they're up. They can't see, they're just doing too much. They can't feel the wind. They don't know when it rains. They're too busy doing something else. They're not alive. And they're also very, very tired. Doing far too much. Being far too little. Because what happens if instead of actually thinking, you just are, just feeling, feeling the wind, feeling the cold, feeling the heat, walking back to the car with your shoes off, feeling the, the stone or the grass under your feet, you feel alive. But not just feeling alive, you are feeding energy into knowing, taking it away from doing so much. And when you put energy back into the passive awareness, knowing, mindfulness, your tiredness starts to go. You wake up. Because the mental tiredness is the knower with very low energy. Put energy into the awareness and you feel awake. A good example of that is having a cup of coffee. Before you have a cup of coffee, you're miserable. Have a cup of coffee, you can feel more, you're awake, you're alive, you can see things, you can hear things, you can think. That's unnatural energy, but it's still energy. But imagine that energy was natural. So you wake up alive. When the mind is energized, it energizes the body. That's why what I was doing, 10 minutes after I was teaching you in a meditation session. That's why usually I give guided meditation almost all the way through. But I was so exhausted, so tired. You know, and if you want to know why, I'll tell you what I've been doing the last two weeks and today. If you know, want to know why, it was there a reason. I should be exhausted. I taught you for 20 minutes and then right, no more doing anything. Kept my mind really still get the energy pouring back into awareness. You wake up, you're alive. Wow, that's incredible. The feeling of the wind. Could you hear that? 
feel it? Wow. Most people wouldn't be able to hear that. But you did. Alive. Energy starts to come back. Time has vanished. Heard a story of a psych oh, it's just at our global conference. A psychologist. <laughs> He's a good psychologist, but a bit crazy. Why you have to pay people to tell you this? It's absolutely ridiculous. His therapy, his method of therapy, which is very, very popular, you go to his place and pay a lot of money, and he tells you to go and have a walk in nature. And it works. You know, people's problems disappear. He makes a lot of money, their problems disappear, and that's it. Smart guy. But why is it walking in nature or being by the ocean, by yourself, not swimming or surfing, just sitting there? Why are you going to a forest and you just do nothing? Why does that, is that therapeutic? Simply because the energy is going back into mindfulness, into knowing. You're not doing so much which means that your tiredness is going, it's vanishing. And when that tiredness vanishes, your health, mental, emotional, physical, increases enormously. You're healing, just because in nature you can't do very much. Check it out this weekend, you've got a choice. Go to the, go shopping, or go into the forest and afterwards check what you feel like afterwards. One is so much doing, you come back tired. You go into a forest or by a beach, a quiet place, by yourself, go to King's Park or whatever, walk along the river, quietly, not really doing much, and you find your tiredness vanishes. Please, for goodness sake, give yourself a break. Too many people getting cancers. Too many partners breaking up. Too many kids just not being able to connect with their parents because their parents can't connect with them because they're too tired. Not being able to listen because they're too dull. For goodness sake, understand tiredness is one of the biggest scourges of our modern age. And there's many, many ways, especially what you've heard tonight, can overcome that tiredness. And I proved it just by giving a talk for 48 minutes, 40, 50 minutes, even though by all reasonable people it should have been impossible. Thank you for listening. Sadhu! Sadhu! So do <laughs> Okay, that's energy. Oof. Very good. What have you got here? From Ireland, France and London. Wow, Europe. How do we deal with the tiredness with people telling us we're wrong or the stuff we believe in is wrong? Just tell them, yeah, you're right. I am wrong. Look, there was... Uh, when I went to Malaysia a lot, uh, this is um, one of the problems. In Malaysia there are also many Christians, and these are the evangelical ones, you know, the ones who want to convert everybody. And so there's a problem in Malaysia, also in Singapore. You know, there's an old Buddhist man, been Buddhist all his life, but his grandkid or his son had become an evangelical. Everyone else was Buddhist or even Hindu or whatever. And the son would think, my father will go to hell if he doesn't convert. So he'd go with his friends and his pastor you know, by the bedside of this really sick and dying person and keep harassing them until they converted. And it was just such a painful experience that even I think the Singapore government you know, made rules against that. And, but someone asked me, so what was your advice? If that's my son, or my grandson, and he comes with all his, and I'm dying, he comes with his past and his friends and they start talking about the Bible and hallelujah and I'm going to go to hell if I don't convert and Jesus is the only way, and oh, what do I do? Is that, 
don't try and convince them they're wrong, you can't. Convert! <laughs> Tell them, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense, grandson, yeah, okay, I will take Jesus as my saviour. And they go, oh hallelujah, hallelujah, and then they leave you alone. And as soon as they've walked out of the door, you can convert back again. <laughs> Become a Buddhist. That's my practical advice. <laughs> so if someone says you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Yeah, so you're right, I agree with you, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, okay. And as soon as, then they leave you alone. And as soon as they leave you alone, oh, that's rubbish, I was right all along. <laughs> Otherwise, it's impossible. I say this even with partners. Whoever you are living with, you should know by now. There we go, oh music to give an answer to a talk by. <laughs> That's fine, it happens, don't be afraid. Anyway, it's not your fault, it's your mobile phone's fault. So don't get angry at you. Spank your mobile phone, <laughs> or whatever. Put your mobile phone in detention. <laughs> anyway, what was I talking about? I was talking about, oh yeah, um, about being wrong. There's no way in the world you'll ever be able to convince your partner that he's wrong. No way. And you should have found that out by now. How long have you been living with that guy? You can't do it. Even if you were sort of, uh, say, what's that, um, the President or the Prime Minister of Germany, what's her name again? Angela Merkel, incredibly smart woman, very powerful. I don't know if she is married, but I bet she always loses arguments with her husband. There's no way that she can convince her husband he's wrong. And Obama cannot convince Michelle, his wife, she's wrong. It's imp doesn't matter how powerful, intelligent you are, it cannot be done. So don't try it. Many husbands understand this man and say, oh yes dear, yes dear, oh yeah, I agree with you dear, I agree with you. And they just go off and do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, so get used to that wives. <laughs> so anyway, we developed, if you haven't heard this yet, I always tell this story when I do weddings, another wedding tomorrow afternoon. There's no way you can convince someone they're wrong. So how can you actually make a decision? and actually get, f get on in life, but not always having to submit. That's a, that really sucks, doesn't it? When, you know, he's always right, why do I always have to agree with him? Or why, do I, why does she always have to be right? So the calendar method, the solution, which allows people to live harmoniously with their partners. The calendar method is that when you have an argument, don't argue who's right and wrong, let the calendar decide. On the odd days of the month, she is right. <laughs> the girl is always right on the odd days of the month. On the even days of the month, he is right. So that's fair. So today is the 19th. So today all the girls are right. Yay! Be careful, tomorrow he's right. Because <laughs> that way you actually don't have to argue anymore. The calendar decides who's right without any arguments and you can make a decision. And it's never that bad if you know, the other person you know, makes a decision, not you. But at least it's fair. And as people have already figured out, all you girls have already figured out, you get more days right a year than he does. Only about four or five, but guys, give it to them. It's worth it. <laughs> The trouble is that people say, well, what happens if you're in a gay relationship? <laughs> yeah, then you got me stumped, it doesn't work. <laughs> Which means both of you are right on one day, and the next day both of you are wrong. <laughs> anyway, when people tell you they're wrong, I just forget about it. Just let them tell you, just do it, don't think about it. And then afterwards you realise, they can tell you whatever they want, it's just rubbish. Do you think there's a link between tiredness and the oxygen we breathe, pollution or how you breathe? I there's a little bit of uh, connection there because oxygen gives you physical energy. And if it's not much oxygen or it's polluted or something like that, of course that will uh, impact on the amount of oxygen you can breathe in. But usually the lungs compensate, so if there's not much oxygen coming in, you breathe in more. <sighs> 
Because that's what happened to me when I went to Bhutan. It was very clear air, but there's hardly any oxygen when you go up to Tiger's Nest. Because, you know, it's very, very high up. Now, at the bottom of that hill, somebody had an energy bar. You know, little energy bar that you can buy here, like a Mars bar or something. But when they got to the top, it ballooned out. And that showed it to me. It was like a balloon because the, the air temperature at the top to the bottom was so different that the pressure inside, you know, at the bottom was just ordinary pressure. By the time you got it to the top, it was like a balloon. So that was actually how high it was and how there was hardly any oxygen there. But what happens is the, just the, the lungs breathe in more. So, yeah, there's a little bit between the tiredness and the oxygen, but not that much because the body usually knows how to compensate. But it doesn't know how to compensate when you think too much. Dear Ajahn from London, what a person can do when they have lost everything in their life and have torturous anxiety about the future? Remember me. I have lost everything in my life. I've lost my degree. I've, it doesn't count for anything anymore. I've lost all my money. I haven't got a cent. I, you know, I had some money when I was young. I, I, what else did I lose? I lost uh, girlfriends, money, possessions, everything. I lost, I lost all my past, all my memories, lost all my fears. I've lost my security. I don't have superannuation. I'm not allowed, according to how monks agreed to take a pension. I haven't got anything. What would happen? What would happen if you didn't feed me tomorrow? Or the day after? Ah! <laughs> now losing everything is not the problem. Sometimes it gives you a lot of freedom. You can live simply, learn to live simply. The torturous anxiety, now that, you've lost possessions but now you're allowing your peace to be lost as well. Recently we had a break-in at Bodhinyana Monastery. They pinched some chainsaws. And straight away I said, look, they can pinch the chainsaws, they can steal that, but they're not going to steal our peace and compassion. We're not going to worry about that. In fact, it, was really, it turned out to be really good, because those chainsaws were quite old, and the insurance allowed us to get really much better ones. <laughs> so if ever that thief is around, come up here, we'll say thank you. I shouldn't say that, but you know, it's actually worked out good in the end. But they can come into your house and they can steal your possessions, but why do you allow them to steal your happiness as well? You don't need to do that. So you may have lost all your physical possessions, maybe lost your wife or your kids or something, but you don't let, need to lose your happiness, especially not your anxiety. That is losing your hope. So what you can do is restore hope, see other people. Sometimes when we have these little groups, you know, of uh, people in the same situation, I forgot what's that called again, the therapy groups, uh, peer support groups, sometimes that when we hear what other people have gone through, which is similar to what we've gone through, and then actually it gives us hope, instead of fear and anxiety. And that's such an important thing to create in your life, hope. So even if you know you're, you haven't been able to find a partner you let get in life, don't give up, keep on going. If you fear you won't, then you will not. If you always have hope, yes, it's possible, then you're opening the doors to success. So always look into the future with a positive mind. And then your life's experience will never take away your hope. And where there's hope, there is success. So thank you for those people. It's nine o'clock now. So is there any questions from the floor? Good, great. Bye bye. <laughs> Okay, we're going to bow now to the Buddha was saying, I'm sorry if I can't say hello to you because I have to rush off and uh, go and teach down at um, Jana Grove for a nice retreat.